Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kerry Reward. Kerry is here. That is Kerry. Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, Dr. Reward is a fruit and vegetable extension specialist at K-State. Uh, Dr. Reward joined the Department of Horticulture, Forestry and Recreation Resources in 2011 as a fruit and vegetable extension specialist with statewide responsibilities. He's located at the K-State uh, Extension Center in Oleta, Kansas, and his research is focused on organic and sustainable vegetable production, tomato grafting, and high tunnel management. Kerry grew up working in his parents' greenhouse business, which is located in South Kansas City, Missouri. He received his bachelor's from Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri, and earned his master's and PhD in plant pathology from North Carolina State University. And uh, Kerry is going to talk about IPM, vegetable crafting. And actually, I heard Kerry talk at the, uh, the ASHS meeting this year. And I thought his talk would really fit in with our theme, uh, today's theme, sustainable horticulture. So welcome, Kerry. Come on. Um, I realize that I'm the guy standing between you and lunch. <laughs> so I will do my best to maybe uh, shorten up the time period a little bit. But we do have a fair amount of info to cover. Um, as we go along. So I'll just go ahead and jump right into it. Oh, but we need to load up my presentation. Let's do that. Where did you save it? I think it? you might just put it on the desktop. Desktop? Uh, maybe not. No, let's go to. We have gardening with native planters. Oh, we might go back. Hold on. Too many things here. I think I saw it on the desktop, actually, if you just remember. No. <laughs> Sorry. It's OK. Sorry, we're having a few technical difficulties yes. here. Did we, oh, here it is. Okay. Oh. Sorry. We are ready. Okay. okay. All right. Now we're ready to get going. Um, so I'll be talking about tomatoes today. How many of y'all have ever grown your own tomatoes? Right? Everybody in the room. They're my favorite crop to work on. Um, Cheryl, what Dr. Boyer didn't tell you, you know, in research, we sort of have two lives. We have this life where we come up and put on nice clothes and talk about what we do. And then we have this other life where we have to wear dirty clothes. And Cheryl mixes soil and grinds things up and plays in the dirt. Well, I spend most of my summers wading in rotten tomatoes and you know, going through worms and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I am located out at the Olathe Horticulture Center uh, out here. And it's just West of here, a little ways, if you get on Santa Fe Road in Olathe, you literally just take Santa Fe all the way out until the road ends. Um, and it's just on the east, eastern edge of the Sunflower Ammunition Plant. Uh, so we're doing a lot of tomato work. We're also doing some other stuff as well. We're doing some work with strawberries uh, and also some work looking at no-till pumpkin production as well. So a little bit about tomato grafting. We all know y'all grow tomatoes. How many of you ever grafted a tomato before? All right, we got a few, nice. Um, how many of you ever heard about tomato grafting before? Seen it in the garden centers? It's, it's kind of snowballing out of control here recently. Um, but this is a relatively new thing. We've been grafting trees and grapevines for a very long time, but herbaceous grafting or green grafting is sort of a new thing. Uh, it started over in Asia, and at first they started working mainly with melons. Uh, in the 1920s, they were trying to control fusarium wilt of melons, so they would actually graft melon onto a gourd rootstock which Fusarium wilt is not a pathogen on gourd, and so they were able to, to have resistant plants and still the fruit that they wanted. Well, the same thing happened in the 1950s and 60s with tomatoes. There's this really bad disease called bacterial wilt uh, caused by a bacteria known as Ralstonia solanaceorum, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, but it became a big problem in Asia and in India, and they decided, hey, we know lots of wild tomato species with really good resistance to this disease, but whenever they breed them, they end up with small, unmarketable fruit. So somebody said, well, let's just chop these plants in half, put them back together, and see if we can have a grafted plant that's going to withstand the disease and still get good fruit production. So that's sort of where it came from. And it's become more and more popular, especially in the last 20 years or so. 
So I start talking really fast when I start talking about tomato grafting. One of the terms I'm going to throw out there a lot is scion. Right? Scion is the top portion or the fruit producing variety. Right? And in this case, we can use heirlooms for scion. We can use typical celebrity or better boy or anything that you like to grow is going to be your scion. Now the root stock, this is the really important part of grafting. Right? In fact, the grafting, the slicing, the dicing really has nothing to do with the benefits. Right? It's all about that root stock. And we typically select um, root stocks that are known as interspecific hybrids. So it's a cross between a wild tomato and a domesticated species. And what this does is it allows it to be very disease resistant. Some of these root stocks are actually resistant to diseases that our commercial varieties are not. Uh, and then it also tends to be very vigorous. And I'll talk about that a little bit too as we go along. So this is just a shot from Korea. Uh, if you go to Asia, Japan, Korea, um, they're doing a lot of grafting over there. They do a, they, a lot of their fruit and vegetable production is in high tunnels and greenhouse, or unheated greenhouses um, and other protected culture. Uh, and so they use a lot of grafting over there. And you can see some of the numbers down here. In this picture, these are grafted watermelons. There's some grafted tomatoes here in this corner. And then I believe grafted peppers underneath. Uh, you can also graft eggplant as well uh, and cucumber. And oftentimes, they'll actually graft eggplant onto a tomato root stock or vice versa. So what about here in the US? What's going on with grafting and using tomatoes with root stocks? Well, there's a lot of different sort of venues or applications that we see for grafting. And, and it's become a very hot topic uh, here lately in terms of research. Um, one of the most important, one of the most useful places for this technology, if you look, sorry, I'm pointing across two things. But uh, this vein right here, if you're looking for organic heirloom tomatoes, Right? Well, heirloom tomatoes are extraordinarily susceptible to diseases. Right? These were bred before there were major resistance genes for uh, disease resistance against leaf blights and root rots and all these kinds of things. So what a lot of our commercial growers are doing, and most of these are farmers market growers, is they're growing their heirlooms inside of high tunnels. A high tunnel is basically an unheated structure. Uh, it gives protection from rain. It also gives a little bit of season extension as well. Uh, but for these heirloom growers in particular, that protection from rain is very important. Because if you can keep the leaves of your plants dry, you can keep your disease way down. Right? So for organic growers, this is one of the best ways to organically manage disease is to literally just keep the plants dry by growing them in a high tunnel. Now, the problem with a high tunnel is you've invested all this money in this structure, right? and, and you want to get the best bang for your buck. Right? So per square foot revenue is really important. Uh, the other thing is, a lot of folks don't want to rotate anymore. Right? We know crop rotation is one of the most important ways to manage soil-borne diseases. And so even some of the best growers that would typically rotate five years outside are only rotating every three years in the high tunnel. And some of them don't rotate at all uh, because they have this enormous investment in these structures. So we see a big issue with soil-borne disease if we're not using rotations. And then we can utilize resistant root stocks to manage some of these diseases. And I think one of the things that we're telling the growers now is, you know, maybe we need to be using resistant root stocks to prevent the introduction of some of these diseases as well. I'll talk a little bit later about fumigation. Uh, for those of you that don't know, a huge portion of our fresh produce that's purchased, and especially tomatoes, uh, is grown in fumigated soil. So this is a fumigant rig right here. Basically what this machine does is it makes that raised bed. It puts plastic down. It puts drip tape down. Uh, and then it also has these small shanks that actually fumigate that soil with gas. And there's lots of different fumigants that are used. Uh, one of the biggest and most heavily used one is called methyl bromide. And it was outlawed about 10 years ago. Well, it, it was outlawed a while ago for production. And so we're running out of it. And, and the big conventional growers <coughs> are looking to alternatives to fumigation for managing soil-borne diseases. So there's some folks that are actually looking at grafting as an alternative to fumigation. There is a lot of research going on uh, in the US. Uh, and I work with a bunch of folks across the US uh, on a specialty crop project. Uh, but, but we also just get together and collaborate a lot. And so I just wanted to point this out that there's a lot of uh, researchers out, doing, out there doing this work, both on tomatoes as well as watermelons. Uh, and actually, uh, Dr. Miles is back in the back of the room. She'll be talking later, but her and I work together on some of this tomato grafting, too. She's, she's also a tomato grafting expert, so don't be afraid to ask her some questions as well. 
if you want to know something about the tomato grafting process, right, this is actually not the presentation you want to be in. I'll tell you at the end of the day uh, which one you want to come to. We are having a workshop coming up pretty soon where we go through all the hands-on technique of grafting. Uh, but I will just breeze through it here real quickly. Basically, you take a small seedling, and again, you can see how small this thing is, right? This would be the rootstock plant. We want to cut it at about a 60-degree angle uh, below the cotyledon. And then there's this small silicon clip that actually goes on top of the stem of the rootstock, right? And then the scion is inserted into that clip, right? And then you press it together really good, and this is where that graft union is going to form. Now, once that, gra uh, once that plant is grafted, it goes into a healing chamber, and this is sort of where the magic happens uh, in terms of trying to, you know, make these, <coughs> these, the plants survive. Um, what we do is we put them in a small tent. We raise the humidity. Sometimes we'll use humidifiers. Like you can see, this is an inlet pipe for a humidifier. Uh, we cut down the light. And basically, the goal is you have to reduce the water stress on that scion for just long enough, about seven to eight days, uh, for that graft union to, to heal and to form and all that plumbing tissue to reconnect. Right? And so that, that takes a fair amount of work. Uh, it also takes a pretty meticulous management uh, to be able to keep these things from cooking inside of that healing chamber as well. We have done a little bit on the economics of propagating these plants, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but I just wanted to point that out. If you're interested in some of these economics, I'd be happy to provide you with a publication that we put out in 2010. Um, we did several case studies on what it costs to graft a plant, and basically what we're seeing is that the added cost of grafting should, is going to range somewhere between 75 cents, excuse me, 50 cents uh, and 75 cents per plant, and maybe as high as a dollar. It kind of depends on how fast you're grafting and those kinds of things. All right, so now we get to talk about diseases. This is the really fun part. Um, there is a fair amount of information available uh, that we've published. Uh, this is a review article, and I thought I'd just throw it in here uh, through uh, <clears throat> that we published in 2000. 10, I believe, in December 2010. And it's basically going to summarize everything that I'm going to talk about in the next five minutes. Uh, this, this publication also includes uh, cucurbits as well. So if you want to learn about disease management and cucurbits with grafting, uh, that's a pretty good resource. All right, so I mentioned soil fumigation before. Um, this is a big issue in, in large-scale conventional production. And it's a big issue for those of us that are, are working towards sustainable uh, production of fruits and vegetables, too, uh, because, the, you know, the use of these chemical fumigants can be very hard on soil biology and ecology. Many of these soil fumigants, like methyl bromide, they're complete biocides. They kill everything in the soil, including weed seeds, pathogen spores, all these kinds of things. So they're a great management tool for managing diseases and weeds, but not necessarily the most sustainable when you start talking about environment. <clears throat> So I mentioned before, uh, soil, soil-borne diseases can be a big issue in high tunnels, right? And this is the other thing that's going on in the U.S. We have this fumigation issue, and then we have this big move to organic high tunnels, and a lot of our high tunnel growers are having problems with soil-borne diseases. This picture does not show tomatoes, obviously, right? These are lettuce, uh, but this is a soil-borne disease called sclerotinia minor um, that causes big problems for many of our high tunnel growers. Now, when I was, uh, I just graduated from NC State, oh, oh, I guess it was two years ago now. Time is flying by. Um, but a lot of this work, this data that we generated, was part of my master's and PhD thesis. So one of the things that I did was I spent a lot of time on the road traveling around doing field trials, actually evaluating these rootstocks, many of which were in on-farm sites. So we would take our plants to a farm, plant them in a replicated manner for the experiment, Right, and then visit them once a week or once every couple weeks, do disease ratings, collect yield data, all that kind of stuff. Uh, North Carolina, from a plant pathologist's perspective, is very blessed uh, because they have a lot of plant diseases there. Uh, the, you know, the South is warm and wet, and, and you got all this water running all over the place, which spreads diseases, not to mention the history of vegetable production there, which is, you know, so you got a lot of inoculum building up all the time. So we were able to work with almost all of the major economically important soil-borne plant pathogens, and I'll talk about all those here in just a minute. So the first one is bacterial wilt, and I mentioned this one before. This is, this is caused by a bacterium called Solanace, uh, Ralstonia solanaceorum, uh, and Ralstonia is a very, very nasty pathogen. 
Uh, thankfully, we don't have it here. So don't start panicking when you start seeing this, these pictures of dying plants. Um, but this is a big issue in the southeast. And there's actually specific strains of this pathogen that exist in Africa and in Holland and parts of Europe uh, that are cold tolerant. And there's a lot of concern among plant pathologists. If that ever gets to the U.S., then this disease could be a big problem for the entire U.S., not just the southeast. But that's a whole other story altogether. So what this bacteria basically does is it lives in the soil. It spreads through water, right? And then it grows into the roots of the plant. And then it grows up into the stem and causes a, a, plumbing, tissue, a plumbing issue, basically. It clogs up that vascular tissue and causes a very dramatic wilt and kills the plant. And it's hard to see, but down in this picture on the, um, on the right-hand corner, there's a bunch of empty plants in those rows. Those are actually, that's a big dead spot what we call a hot spot for bacterial wilt. And this is really common in heavily infested soils where you actually have complete meltdown of the crop. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we found through our research is that not only is Ralstonia a very devastating pathogen, but it's also a very tricky one as well. And, and this one was one of the toughest ones. Uh, we still haven't figured it out. Part of the reason is because we have several rootstocks that show resistance to bacterial wilt in, in one location, but then you move to another location and you see the exact opposite. And the reason for this is because this is a bacterial plant pathogen, so genetically it's very diverse. It, it's a very complex bug, and it's a complex issue, uh, but we're still uh, looking at new rootstocks to manage this disease, and there's a large group, uh, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina, working with this pathogen a lot right now. Fusarium wilt is one that I definitely see in the Midwest. Uh, this is one to sort of keep an eye out for. Fusarium wilt is caused by a fungal plant pathogen, and, and this fungi basically does the same thing. It grows up into the tissue of the plant, causes a plumbing issue, right? And then you see what's called a vascular wilt disease. Now, one thing that's real diagnostic about fusarium wilt is, for one thing, it will actually yellow the leaves. It doesn't cause as much true wilting, but, it, but what it does is it causes problems with nutrient uptake in the plant. And so you'll see like an entire yellow leaf just randomly somewhere in the leaf. Or quite often we see what's called unilateral wilting, where one side of the leaf turns yellow and the other side is green. Now, <clears throat> this disease is actually very easy to manage uh, unless you're an heirloom tomato fan. Uh, if you open up your seed catalog, right, and you see a Better Boy VFN tomato, the F on that seed catalog stands for Fusarium Wilt Resistance Race 1, right? So, and most of your hybrids, anything that's celebrity or newer, you know, 1970s or newer, is going to have fusarium wilt resistance in it. So you don't have to worry about it too much. This can be a big problem if you want to grow heirloom tomatoes, right? So in this case, what we do is we actually graft our heirlooms. In this case, this was German Johnson, uh, a real popular pink beefsteak heirloom tomato. And we grafted it onto a couple different rootstocks. Uh, one is Robusta, and the other is Maxifort. Right? And what ended up happening was uh, the Maxifort showed absolutely no symptoms. It did not get the disease because it carries resistance to Fusarium wilt race 1. Now, Robusta, unfortunately, carried resistance to Fusarium wilt race 2, but not race 1. And so we actually did see some um, disease pressure there. <clears throat> Southern blight is caused by Sclerotium ralsii. And this is another fungal plant pathogen. And it is somewhat common here. Uh, we do see it occasionally. It's actually, uh, Sclerotium rossia is a very cosmopolitan pathogen. It gets on a lot of plants, has a very wide host range. This is actually more of a problem in our ornamentals than it is for our vegetables, but we will see it occasionally on tomato. Now, the tricky thing about southern blight uh, is that it loves carbon, right? It loves organic soils. If you use cover crops, you're doing all the right things to build healthy soils, you're also feeding Sclerotium rossii, unfortunately. Uh, so this is, can be a real big problem for organic growers that are doing a lot of uh, cover crops and adding organic material as well. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> with southern blight, there's no resistance available from any commercial tomato line. Uh, you can look in any of the seed catalogs, ask any of the seed guys, there is no resistance to southern blight. There was two lines that were released by Texas A&M back in the 90s. Uh, but they were never actually turned into a, a commercial cultivar. So this one is very difficult to manage organically, and it's a big problem for organic growers. 
Now, one of the things that we found, uh, the other thing I should have mentioned, this pathogen loves hot weather. And if you have a really hot summer, then you tend to see quite a bit of it more than during the cool summers. 2007 and 2008 were very hot summers. Uh, you may remember they were definitely very hot summers in North Carolina. And we were lucky enough to get really heavy southern blight pressure on lots of our rootstock trials. And as it turned out, several of these rootstocks, I'm sorry this picture is not coming through very well. Uh, several of our rootstocks, including Big Power, Beaufort, and Maxifort, all had very good resistance. They did not show any symptoms of this disease, whereas our non-grafted controls had anywhere from 25 to 80 percent incidence. And when you have 80 percent incidence of southern blight, you have 80 percent plant death, right? So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Root knot nematodes are another fun bug to play around with. Uh, these are very popular in sandy soils. They really like sand where they can swim around in the water films. Uh, nematodes are basically submicroscopic worms that live in the soil. Uh, nematodes live everywhere. They live on plants, they live in the soil, they actually live on us uh, as well. They're kind of fun creatures that way. Um, but they also cause diseases on plants as well, right? And this is what's called root knot nematode. Uh, and, and what it does is it actually invades the roots of the tomato plant and sets up this very specialized feeding site uh, uh, that's basically called a giant cell and forms these galls. And what it does is it, it lives down in that root, in that gall, and produces eggs, right? Millions and millions of eggs. And it also drinks all that delicious photosynthate out of the tomato plant. So one of the most common symptoms for this disease is really just to see small, stunted plants. And we definitely have this disease in Kansas. I've seen it um, quite a number of times, especially when you get out to the central part of the state where we have a lot of heavy sand soils. Now, one of the tricks here, uh, similar to Fusarium wilt, we have major resistance. In other words, you open that seed catalog back up, and it says, better boy, VFN. Well, the N stands for nematode resistance. So if you buy a hybrid that says N on it, then it should be resistant. Again, our heirloom growers are going to have troubles with this. Um, but we wanted to look and see how our rootstocks were working. <clears throat> so this is combined data from 2007 and 2008. Uh, what you can see is that basically our non-grafted plants had very, very heavy root knot galling. And when you pull these things out of the ground, they look like a dreadlock, literally. That's, that's what it looked like, or a string of pearls, maybe. Um, the, the fumigated treatments, in this case, we were using fumigant, fumigant as a control because we wanted to compare grafting versus a conventional standard. Uh, and what's typical of fumigated beds is the roots grow out of that fumigated zone, right? Because that fumigant can only get six, seven inches down into the soil. The roots grow out, the nematodes find the roots, and you know, even though it delays the epidemic, uh, you still see some pretty heavy pressure at the end of the year. What was interesting is this one root stock, Big Power, showed no symptoms, no galling all the way into the very end of the year. And again, this is two years of data put together. Um, so we're really excited to see this root stock was, was functioning well. The thing we weren't so excited about and a little surprised about is that a couple of our rootstocks are actually showing pretty heavy galling. And these are rootstocks that are supposed to be carrying that N gene, that, that resistance to nematode gene known as the MI gene. Uh, and so there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to find out what's going on, maybe because these interspecific hybrids, there's something going on with the cell physiology of the plant and it's not allowing it to work functionally. Now one of the things that's nice about root knot nematode resistance is you can actually manage nematode populations. Uh, here, if you look at these two rootstocks, these were the ones that we saw galling on, uh, and so they had sort of moderate resistance, the ones highlighted in blue. And they basically cut the populations down, but at the end of the year, you still had pretty large populations of root knot nematodes. Um, fumigant, again, cuts it way down at the beginning, but then it pops back up towards the end of the year. But the really fun part about this is, is we saw that big power you know, this was the one that showed no symptoms. It wasn't allowing those nematodes to reproduce, right? And so we were able to stop the reproduction of, of these pathogens in the soil. <clears throat> All right, verticillium wilt is, caused, is another fungal plant pathogen. Uh, but verticillium wilt is a little bit different than a lot of the ones that we've talked about so far. Verticillium wilt is a very slow grower. It likes cool weather. Uh, this is a disease we have very... Uh, I would say this is our predominant soil-borne disease on tomato uh, in this area, and I I've, I've see it all over the place. Um, 
one of the things that's tough with verticillium wilt is there's this thing called race two of the pathogen. All right, so we open our better boy, our book back up, and we see better boy VFN. Right, well, that V stands for resistance to verticillium wilt. And basically, back in the 80s, I think they released this thing called the VD gene, right, which is resistance to that um, particular pathogen. Unfortunately, however, the fungi is able to overcome that resistance. And so now, uh, what we have is called race two, right? So this is a specific strain of the pathogen that was able to overcome that resistance, and now it predominates the populations in the soil. So even though your catalogs say VFN, resistant to verticillium wilt, I'm here to tell you that there's no tomatoes out there resistant to verticillium wilt race two, right? And race two is, is a predominant strain everywhere. It's not like some people have race one and others have race two. Uh, pretty much everybody has race two. Now, one of the major things that this pathogen does, because it's a slow grower, and it's another vascular wilt disease, it grows into the stem of the plant, and then it very slowly strangles the plant. And oftentimes, we don't see uh, heavy symptoms until late in the, in the season. And for this reason, this, one of the predominant ways that this disease is managed uh, nationally, not just here, uh, but especially on the East Coast, uh, in Pennsylvania, New York, North Carolina, up in the cooler parts of the tomato growing regions, is they fumigate the soil. Because what they can do is they can kill that pathogen in the top 10 inches, right? The roots grow in and they get infected eventually, but it's late enough and this is a slow growing enough pathogen that you can still get a good crop off. So our idea was, well, we know the biology of the pathogen is such uh, that it basically just slowly strangles the plant, right? So maybe we can graft a very, very vigorous rootstock onto it that's not gonna be penalized by the activity of this pathogen, right? And so that was our sort of going hypothesis. Again, there's no resistance known to this disease anywhere. So we actually worked on this guy for several years, and I'm just gonna show this one data set. Uh, but what we found is that we actually have some rootstocks that are showing tolerance or uh, tolerance to the pathogen, and I'll, I'll explain what that means here in just a second. So if you look at this graph, uh, that black line is non-grafted, right? And this is basically pounds Oh, no, that's tons per acre. Sorry about that. Um, when we fumigate, and this is with non-grafted plants indicated by that green bar, uh, we get about a 20% yield in, in production. So we know that that pathogen is causing damage. It's causing yield decreases to the plant. Now, if we look at our grafted plants, in this case, we grafted them with Maxifort, and Maxifort is an extraordinarily vigorous rootstock, uh, and you'll, you might hear about it later on as well. Um, then we don't see much difference between the fumigated and the non-fumigated plants in terms of yield. And again, this isn't disease levels, this is yield, right? We know and we do see symptoms of verticillium wilt on grafted plants. But the most important symptom, crop yield, is actually unaffected uh, depending, you know, no matter if the disease pressure is high or if it's been fumigated and it's maybe a little bit lower. Uh, so what that means is these, these rootstocks seem to probably be tolerant and we're still kind of pursuing this. Um, we haven't published this information yet. I think there's still some more studies to be done, but this could be a good sign for folks that are dealing with this pathogen. Uh, in this particular study, we did a, do a little bit of economics, so I thought I'd just show this real quick. Um, we did some work with plant spacing, and I won't talk about that now. One of the things we found, both economically and in some ways just managing the plants, we want to space out our grafted plants a little bit. They're quite vigorous, um, and so we want to give them a little room to grow. And keep in mind that these transplants cost quite a bit more as well. So if we can reduce our planting density, the commercial farmers can make more money that way. So we've done a lot of work looking at planting density and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so sort of the, all, the, the take home message on disease management is that we've been able to look at a lot of different rootstocks. And this is actually not an all inclusive list. Um, the, the, that list is getting to be very, very long now. Uh, but one of the things that we found is with our, our major gene resistance, uh, most of them work very well. Root knot nematode could be the one exception to this, uh, where we need to do some more research and find out, you know, what's going on in that plant to cause that MI gene to not work so well. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is that if, if you're an heirloom grower uh, and you're having disease issues like this, you don't necessarily have to graft onto a rootstock to get um, resistance to these diseases because much of, much of the times, the resistance exists out in our commercial hybrids. Our hybrids. 
One thing you'll find is that tomato rootstock seed is very, very expensive. Uh, and so if you want to just kind of play around with this, you may not want to go out and buy the rootstock seed. You may be able to use a cherry tomato seed or something like that as, uh, as a rootstock. Now, this is not the case with bacterial wilt. Bacterial wilt, there's no commercial resistance out there. Um, this is a, you know, again, it's not a prevalent disease here, so I won't talk about it too much. Um, but this is one of the driving forces right now with grafting in terms of selecting rootstocks because you can see there's a lot of variability in terms of what rootstocks are resistant and which aren't. And then again, one of the things that was kind of nice about the work we did is we were able to add a column to this table. Southern blight had never been managed with host resistance before. People use chemicals or they use other cultural management tools. Uh, but in this case, we're able to actually implement host resistance, which is a, a you know, sort of the, the cornerstone of sustainable disease management. All right, so we're going to flip gears for a minute, uh, and then I'll real briefly talk a little bit about the research that we've done at K-State with grafting tomatoes, uh, and then I'll let you guys get on out to lunch here. Um, when I was out in North Carolina, one of the larger projects that we did was actually the funding project for my PhD was looking at grafting in a non-disease situation. So we had all this data collecting, you know, that we were doing, trying to evaluate root stocks, decide which ones would be better for certain disease issues and that kind of thing. And in this case, we're trying to find out, is grafting actually beneficial if there's no disease, right? Is, is this vigor that we see in the field, is it actually going to translate to increased fruit yield? Uh, so we put out a very large study. Um, it included tons and tons of stuff, and I've boiled it down to like two slides worth of data. Uh, so I'm not going to describe it all, but, but we basically looked at grafted plants inside the high tunnel and out in the open field. We looked at it in different, lots of different fertility, nutrient levels, uh, as well as plant spacing and plant density. So this is just, a, I'm just going to highlight the total yield here real quick uh, before we move on. And basically what we saw, this is data from 2007, and we saw, you know, 40 to 50 percent increase in yield. Now in this case, they're grafted onto Cherokee purple. Uh, and we sort of found since then the Cherokee purple, we were kind of lucky in this case, Cherokee purple really likes to be grafted. It, it benefits well from it, right? And we see that with our data uh, sort of across the board. So don't get too excited about 50% increases in yield. Um, but we were able to significantly increase the yield. And there really wasn't much difference between Beaufort and Maxifort, and those are the two root stocks we were looking at. Uh, in 2008, uh, Beaufort did uh, provide a tiny bit more fruit than Maxifort. It wasn't statistically significant. But again, both of them increased fruit yield you know, pretty significantly. Uh, what, I guess we have about 30, 35 to 40% increases in fruit yield in 2008. 2008, in this case, was a much cooler year. And I think our, our grafted, our warmer year in 2007 brought out that benefit of grafting a little bit, maybe. One of the other things that we were looking at uh, with this non-disease situation is there had been a lot of reports and sort of assumptions uh, that the benefit of grafting is towards the end of the year. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the hydroponic greenhouse industry is completely using grafted plants. And one of the reasons that the greenhouse industry has moved to grafted plants is because they can increase their production cycle from about eight months to 12 months. And so they see much higher production late in the season uh, than you would with a non-grafted plant. And we had sort of seen that anecdotally in our data as well. But we wanted to really get down to some statistics and analyze it. And so what we did was we took our, our basically our harvest across the course of the year. And this represents open field and high tunnel for two years. Uh, and then we looked at where these yield benefits were. And most of the time, the biggest bump that we got was actually sort of mid, early to midway through the season. And so you know, not only is that interesting to find out, but it's also kind of encouraging to growers because you know, nobody wants to go out and pick tomatoes in August when everything's really nasty. We want to get them early, right? We want to get them to market. <clears throat> so conclusions from the research that we've done so far, you know, again, rootstocks provide an excellent way to manage diseases. And they do this in, a, in several different mechanisms, right? We have single gene resistance. I mentioned fusarium wilt and root knot nematodes. Uh, also quantitative resistance. So in this case, this is, this is where that wild tomato rootstock really comes into play because it's able to bring over multiple genes and actually code for resistance. We also saw an example with verticillium wilt where we saw disease tolerance, right? So in this case, the plants get symptoms. They may show some levels of disease, but the plants were still able to perform in infested soils. 
Another thing that we've seen, and I didn't talk too much about it because we're really focused on the IPM side today, uh, is that these plants are much more vigorous than non-grafted plants. And, it, and it, a lot of that is very rootstock specific. We have several that are very uh, vigorous where others may not be so much. It's also kind of dependent on rootstock scion interactions. And I mentioned this before, but there are some plants that make really great scion because they're able to convert all that vigor into increased fruit yield. And there's some that make really terrible scion because you end up with this giant tree of a plant and four fruit on there, right? And so you wanna, you wanna get into this carefully. I wouldn't go out and bet the whole farm on one specific combination of rootstock and scion. So just real quick, I'll briefly talk about some of the work that we've done at K-State since I arrived here. Um, there's a lot of growers in this area growing in high tunnels. That's one of the predominant ways people are growing tomatoes uh, in this region. And so we, we thought it might be a good opportunity to look and find out and see what grafting could do. Um, so we actually work in this area from a couple different angles. Uh, we, we work a fair amount on the, the propagation side, um, you know, trying to determine some of the best ways to manage the plants to get the best grafting success. Uh, also evaluating rootstock for diseases and for yield and vigor. Uh, we're starting to do some nematode trials down in central Kansas, looking at resistance for nematodes. Um, and also verticillium wilt race too. We're going to be chasing that one all my life, I think. <clears throat> and then again, just trying to get these integrated into our high tunnel systems. What are the cultural management practices? What are the ways that we can utilize these plants? So Sarah Masterson, I thought I'd just introduce her to you all. Um, she's, I think she's actually transplanting tomatoes today up on campus. Um, so you'll be happy to hear that. Um, Sarah's a graduate student that works with me and she came in in 2011 and she's been working on a project, uh, both looking at the propagation side. You can see all these healing chambers that we've got set up in the greenhouse on campus, uh, but also helping with some of the field work as well. And she's been doing a, a really great job. We expect that she's gonna graduate this summer. Now, one of the things that we really like to do, and this is something, uh, you know, I did a lot of in North Carolina, but really like to integrate growers into the research, right? doing on-farm research and trying to connect with our local growers and find out if they really think there's a benefit to this technology. And one of the best ways to do this is to put a field plot on a grower's farm, uh, collect all the data, look at the data, and then come back a couple years later and see if these growers are adopting these practices. And in many of these cases, they do. Right? Because they can take that data and say, wow, you know, this, this is making this much difference on my farm. So we value this a lot in my, in my research program is trying to interact with growers and get some on-farm research going. And, and I think this year we had four on-farm trials for our grafting studies. We had a couple of strawberry trials on-farm and a, as well as a pumpkin study too. So this just shows you some pictures of what some of these trials look like. Uh, this is actually at our research station in, a, in one of our high tunnels. Um, this is actually a very large high, tun high tunnel. It's about 24 by 200 feet long. Uh, it's, it's my favorite place to grow tomatoes in the summer. You can see there's a small amount of shade on these rows of plants, right? Uh, the plastic that we use actually diffuses light and cuts about 15% of the light out. And believe it or not, um, these last two summers when it's just been tremendously hot, this is the only place we can grow tomatoes on our farm, is undercover. Right? And you can put shade cloth on them too, which really helps. And it's nice too, you can plant early so the, the plants get going, they get started uh, before you know, they kick on the furnace and everything starts leaning over. So here's just a little bit of that data. Uh, let's see, this is from our tunnel, uh, and this is 2011 and 2012. And basically what we're seeing is, you know, again, we, we have very low verticillium wilt pressure in that tunnel, um, but we're seeing pretty significant benefits in terms of total fruit yield. I think in this case, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40 to 45 percent. And again, this is uh, 2011 and 2012. So Sarah's excited. When you're a graduate student and you have two, these two years where the bars actually match that closely, that's an amazing thing. It's like, wow, I can write a thesis now. Look at that. Uh, this is from an on-farm study that we did. Actually, just over here in Johnson County, I'm sure some of y'all may know Frank and Mel Gieringer. Uh, they have a, a UPIC peach orchard, blackberry. They now have a strawberry uh, UPIC operation as well. Uh, and, and they also have about six high tunnels they grow tomatoes in. And so we've been doing work in, in their tunnels as well. 
Strangely, in 2011, there was a tremendous yield in Frank's um, tunnels from the grafted plants. And I think part of it was it was a very poor yield for the non-grafted plants. So we actually saw like a 100% increase in fruit yield. I've, I've never seen that before. Um, but this year was a little more typical. You can see the non-grafted plants up here about 130 pounds. And then our grafted ones about 165, 170. So again, we're seeing 30 to 40% increases in yield. Last but not least, uh, I did tell you that I was going to tell you how to find out more about how to carry out grafting. Uh, so we are doing a workshop here at the end of the month on February 25th. Uh, where we're actually going to bring plants in. The plants are going in the greenhouse right now. And then um, we'll teach you how to do the grafting, and then you can actually get some hands-on uh, activity and a little practice if you want. Um, this is run through our Growing Growers program. It's also in collaboration with Cultivate KC. You all may know uh, they run an urban farming group up in KCK. And it'll be, it's at the Rosedale Development Association right on Southwest Boulevard down in Kansas City, Kansas. So if you want to learn how to graft, this is one of your probably one of the best opportunities here. Uh, so with that, I think I have the wrong acknowledgement slide. There it is. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take your all's questions. I really appreciate the attention, uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>